Chronic kidney disease. What does that mean? It means we're talking in terms of months, specifically a three-month period of time. In terms of the disease part of the, the concept of chronic kidney disease, it turns out that GFR is not the only discriminating component in defining whether someone has chronic kidney disease, although it is obviously central in so many parameters of kidney health. The other component is the damage that is detected either through albumin in the urine, blood in the urine, whether frank or microscopic, or a structural anomaly on imaging, or an abnormal histologic finding on biopsy. Unfortunately, one other component of chronic kidney disease is that it is irreversible. We will refer to the five stages of kidney disease where stage one is normal, GFR equal to or greater than 90. Stage two is uh, GFR between 60 and 89. Now, for stage one and stage two, even if you've got a GFR at either of those levels, greater than 90 or 60 to 89, for three months, you do not have chronic kidney disease unless you have evidence of kidney damage. Stages three to five, though, are where GFR becomes the critical uh, value by which we diagnose a person as having chronic kidney disease. Stages three, four, and five, three, is divided into 3A and 3B. 3A is 45 to 59 GFR. 3B is 30 to 44. Stage four is 15 to 29 GFR, or a GFR of 15 to 29 milliliters per minute per 1.73 square meters. And stage five is the uh, unfortunate end stage kidney disease or end stage renal failure, which you will see often in uh, notes, ward rounds as ESKD or ESRF. In terms of socioeconomic status, the lowest socioeconomic group has a rate of 14 people per 100,000 uh, developing end stage kidney disease each year between the years of 2012 and 2016, this is averaged out. Whereas the highest socioeconomic group has nine per 100,000 population, uh, nine people developing end-stage kidney disease. It's a rather shameful figure. Uh, indigenous uh, incidents averaged over 12, 2012 to 2016, roughly 40 indigenous people per 100,000. And this slide tells us about uh, the financial cost Interestingly, uh, hospital hemodialysis per year is 80,000. And when it says satellite hemodialysis, that's not referring to someone orbiting uh, Earth uh, on dialysis. <laughs> that would be uh, interesting and probably a lot more expensive. Uh, satellite hemodialysis is for the most stable patients. In terms of etiologies, uh, according to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, October 30, 2019, based on 2016 data, uh, incidence of all new cases of chronic kidney disease, stages uh, one through five. Uh, diabetes was the most common etiology, 35%. Glomerulonephritis of manifold causes, 18%. Hypertension was 14%. And polycystic kidney disease, 6%. I'd like to make a note here about the diseases of chronic kidney disease. I mentioned that chronic kidney disease can be characterized by two to three criteria. These were time and then parenchymal damage and finally GFR. And I also mentioned that chronic kidney disease is irreversible. In the previous slide, I mentioned the common etiologies that can lead to CKD. For example, hypertension, diabetes, what about the actual disease part of, of the concept of chronic kidney disease? Is there a way to approach the, the nebulous number of, of diseases that constitute the, the totality of the concept of chronic kidney disease? Because chronic kidney disease is not just one thing. But what are the diseases in terms of anatomy and clinical features? What about the modifiability of the disease? And whether the disease is part of a bigger picture at the systemic level. 
Well, unfortunately, there's no neat systematic conceptual map of the diseases that are part of the, the concept of chronic kidney disease. So an example of a, of a conceptual map that starts from one dichotomy and then progresses through numerous hierarchies until we arrive at a unique set of features of a particular disease. So for this talk, I'm focusing less on the various causes at the histologic or molecular levels of analysis, and instead on the more macroscopic causes. Although glomerulonephritides are among the top five etiologies of chronic kidney disease in Australia, the variability in the pathophysiologic details of glomerulonephritides warrants its own discussion. Thus, I've constrained our examination to diabetes and hypertension as the uh, causes of CKD. The other reason for focusing on just these two is that they're preventable. So perhaps our examination can serve as a kind of motivation uh, to consider our role uh, as health and lifestyle counsellors, if you will, um, that we might all pursue in our work as doctors. For completeness, however, and I'm not fond of that phrase, a common way of compartmentalising the multifarious etiologies can be found in publications like Kumar and Clark's Clinical Medicine or Toronto Notes. And as an example, uh, Toronto Notes, for example, I like, uh, it breaks things up into uh, renal vascular diseases, of which you can further distinguish large and small vascular diseases, and then whether they're secondary to systemic diseases like hypertension or scleroderma, or if they're kidney specific. And then you could break them down further into when they're, whether they're acquired or genetic. Then uh, the next big distinction the, after that is glomerular diseases, and then distinctions according to the extents of change, um, whether it's many glomeruli affected or only a few, whether those that are affected are completely affected or only segmentally affected. Uh, the types of change, whether they're proliferative or membranous or involving crescents, uh, or the clinical presentation, so uh, the well-known nephrotic nephritic spectrum. And then you could also ask whether they're acquired or genetic and so forth. And finally, you've got the tubular interstitial diseases. This is the third big branch of the uh, triumvirate um, that is a common way to break down the details of uh, etiologies. So um, tubular interstitial diseases, uh, which can initially be distinguished according to whether they affect the PCT, the DCT or the duct, and whether the cause is acquired or inherited and so forth. So all textbooks commonly also add on systemic diseases with renal manifestations like scleroderma, for example, or type 2 diabetes. However, the, the, the triumvirate of uh, classifications, glomerular, uh, glomerular diseases, uh, renal vascular diseases and tubular interstitial diseases capture those um, systemic diseases within them. Uh, in any case, uh, this digression is just to remind us of the landscape of the discussion about the extensive causes of CKD and how one could carve them up. The patient in this case, uh, a kind of a model patient in the sense that the patient had uh, hypertension, obesity and was diabetic for many, many years. And this is useful for us in that it gives us one, or in this case, three different uh, pathways by which one can unfortunately develop chronic kidney disease. Now, there are many others. These are the most common in the Western countries and especially in the, in the area of Western Sydney. The patient in this case has been sent from the GP uh, after she developed paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea getting up in the middle of the night, not being able to breathe, catch a breath. The number of uh, pillows for her orthopnea had increased from two to three. She noticed decreasing exercise tolerance, although she wasn't a sprinter or a marathon runner, but uh, she was able to walk around the house uh, with a walker, and recently she couldn't even get to the bathroom. Legs had been more puffy than usual. She'd had some worsening leg cramps, she thinks. They were ongoing. Uh, and she'd also had a slight worsening, she thinks, of glove stocking paresthesias, uh, which were due to her diabetes. Important negatives, uh, she didn't have confusion, she didn't have dysuria, so she didn't have any particularly foul-smelling urine or stinging on micturition. Uh, she was normouric, as she was still passing about one litre a day. The urine wasn't 
especially frothy, nor was it bloody, and she didn't have bone pain. And these will become more obvious, hopefully, a bit later in the talk. This patient's past medical history is notable for type 2 diabetes, and she was on short-acting and long-acting insulins. She also had hypertension, as well as congestive cardiac failure, and she was on an angiotensin receptor blocker and a hydrochlorothiazide. She was also on a loop diuretic, frizomide, and a cholesterol absorption inhibitor. She was obese, and she had obstructive sleep apnea. She'd also relatively recently had a left hallux amputation uh, that was because of osteomyelitis and she was given some peripherally inserted central catheter antibiotics for six weeks which caused some problems. Baseline bloods we have uh, HbA1c of 8%, creatinine around the 100s on average, uh, her GFR was about 53, sodium and potassium were normal, uh, hemoglobin was 110, which is a little bit low uh, for a woman. should be about 115, but uh, mean cell volume was 80 femtoliters, which is normal range. Calcium was low, 1.7. Phosphate was high at 2, and magnesium was low at 0.6. Social history, she doesn't smoke, she doesn't drink alcohol, and she hasn't ever used illicit drugs. She's not travelled for more than 10 years, and she has had no sick contact. So, you order some investigations at the bedside. The bedside urine test comes back with protein, it's no nitrites. Protein, you think to yourself, that's not supposed to be there. The BGL is 14.9. The ECG is normal sinus rhythm, regular pulse. Results of blood tests for the patient uh, came back. Uh, HbA1c was now 9.6, it was formerly around 8. Creatinine was 350. It was formerly around 100 baseline. GFR was now 9. It was formerly around 53, I think. Uh, sodium and potassium were normal, as they were from the baseline bloods. Uh, hemoglobin was slightly lower at 95 instead of 110. Mean cell volume was still around uh, the 80s. Uh, calcium was lower than before. It was 1.4. Phosphate was 2.1, which was higher. And magnesium was slightly lower at 0.5. Anemia screens had B9, B12 were normal. When it comes to chronic kidney disease and electrolyte disturbances, I just want to quickly mention hyponatremia, hyperkalemia. They're due very briefly and very clearly due to the inability of the uh, nephron to get rid of water and uh, potassium. You can also get a loss of uh, the ability to uh, excrete protons, which we know as acid, which leads to acidosis acidemia and acidosis, uh, but not in this particular patient. With respect to calcium and phosphate, uh, a kidney damage leads to the inability to uh, hydroxylate uh, calcidiol to calcitriol. Calcitriol is uh, necessary for uh, calcium homeostasis. It increases calcium absorption from the gut and reabsorption from the bones. If you can't produce Calcitriol, you don't get enough calcium. However, you also lose the ability to excrete phosphate. So phosphate builds up, you get hyperphosphatemia, and because you can't absorb as much calcium, you get hypocalcemia. Uh, the mechanism is more complex than that, but that gives you a rough idea. For investigation, one might consider transthoracic echocardiogram. The reason why uh, one would order this is because uh, with poor ability to get rid of fluid, one increases the afterload uh, and the heart therefore has to work harder. So let's say someone comes in with acute pulmonary edema and you're thinking, well, they're overloaded because their kidneys aren't working. Correct. But perhaps their heart is also giving out because uh, the heart has had to work against a greater afterload. In terms of hypertensive nephropathy, the high blood pressure at the afferent arteriole uh, leads to hyalinosis of the arteriole. And then hyalinosis triggers uh, endothelial hypertrophy, which is arteriosclerosis. Then one also gets tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis. So we've got damage at the tubule, the interstitium, and at the glomerulus.
the aforementioned glomerular uh, hyalinosis. So we've got the afferent arteriole being hyalinized. Now we've got the glomerulus being hyalinized. They then become sclerosed. There's also damage to the basement membrane and podocytes, and we lose the filter from where we get proteinuria and hematuria. The juxtaglomerular cells detect decreased blood flow because of the uh, endothelial hypertrophy. They trigger the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and that in turn constricts the efferent arteriole in an attempt to increase filtration pressure within the glomerulus, which means you get further glomerular damage. Any loss of, of glomeruli is compensated by other glomeruli, and one theory is that this kind of shunting of blood to other glomeruli uh, leads to higher pressure within them, uh, and so you get a kind of reiterative progressive uh, sequential damage. Useful exam preparation uh, when it comes to the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease very broadly is the accumulation of advanced glycation end products, which triggers uh, inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, which then increases deposition of type 4 collagen and mesangial cell expansion, which in turn causes hyalinosis, which in turn leads to basement membrane hypertrophy. And then eventually we have nodular sclerosis. In terms of stages of development over, over time, initially we have increased GFR, and that's uh, due to uh, glomerular and tubular hypertrophy, and then that leads to microalbuminuria. Microalbuminuria usually spontaneously resolves though, and then after about five to 10 years, we have mesangial cell expansion, which leads to hyperfiltration, Due to increased, likely due to increased pressure in the glomerulus. And then we have microalbuminuria. So again, increased GFR, then mesangial cell expansion five to 10 years later, which leads to hyperfiltration. And then five to 10 years after that, so as early as 10 years, but as late as 20 years, and anywhere in between, we have microalbuminuria. And then eventually we have decreased GFR and proteinuria, so bigger than albumin. We've got more larger sized particles, which we'll see in a few slides. This diagram pinpoints what the signaling level, the underlying causes of the hyalinization and damage we see to the um, capillaries and other structures of the glomerulus in so far as we're talking about diabetes. IGF is insulin-like growth factor. It has anabolic effects. TGF-alpha is mitogenic. VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, as the name suggests, is a growth factor that stimulates uh, endothelial uh, growth. NFKB is a molecule that uh, regulates cytokine production uh, and in response to stress controls DNA transcription. The JAK STAT pathway, it's a chain of interactions between proteins um, involved in things like immunity and cell death and tumor formation and cell division. This slide gives you an idea of the problem when we lose the ability for the glomerulus to withhold certain things like proteins. You can see that the fenestrations in the capillaries of a certain size and that allows tiny little things like glucose, sodium or creatinine to get through. When it comes to things like albumin, they're not going to get through and globulins won't get through. When it comes to the special test of a measuring a urine protein, uh, the gold standard, I guess, is a 24-hour urine collection test. This is uh, difficult for obvious reasons. But as a principle, the idea is that we elect urine from the patient over 24 hours and we should expect to see a normal or non-pathologic accumulation of roughly 150 milligrams over 24 hours. If it's greater than 300 milligrams in 24 hours, we're talking about frank proteinuria that you can uh, see probably with increased frothiness of the urine.
Now, the components of that 150 milligrams are albumin, TAM horsefowl proteins, which also are uh, uh, secreted or excreted, I should say, from the renal tubules, and then immunoglobulins and secretory IgA make up the rest. Uh, in this case, our patient had almost 2 grams, so 2,000 milligrams over 24 hours. So she could be said to be quite proteinuric. should make mention that more specific uh, tests of urinary protein uh, are the uh, albumin-creatinine ratio and protein-creatinine ratio. Albumin uh, less than 3 uh, as, as, a, as a ratio uh, to creatinine uh, is normal, and then as you can see, uh, greater than 30 is nephrotic range. Units of milligrams per millimole, uh, just in case you want to work out what's, what, what the ratio is. The molar mass of creatinine is 114 grams per mole, if the daily normal albumin excretion is 60 milligrams or less. The protein creatinine ratio is less than 15, and remember 150 milligrams is what we should be excreting or less of total protein per day. So with this diagram, we can, we've can we got a schematic of the normal versus the diabetic glomerulus. As you can see, the mesangial cells are relatively well delineated, smaller than they are in the affected glomerulus. The endothelium of the glomerulus is quite thin, as is the uh, basement membrane, whereas in the diseased glomerulus, the membrane is a bit thicker. We've also got less podocytes. Uh, it's called podocyte effacement. And as we can see in diagram E, there's foot process effacement, meaning uh, wearing away or, or destruction of the foot processes, which again um, is affecting the ability to withhold substances from leaking out into bone and space, substances that we need for oncotic pressure, for example. In terms of complications, they're quite nasty when it comes to chronic kidney disease, and obviously these complications become more frequent and more likely uh, the uh, further one uh, travels down the chronic kidney disease stage ladder. Uh, so pain, roughly half the patients on hemodialysis will suffer from pain. You can obviously use paracetamol, but fentanyl and methadone are the safest, safest opioids. We also use uh, hydromorphone uh, at the pain hospital. Um, acidosis, you can give sodium bicarb, obviously, and, and I should restate that these are only complications one should manage acutely. If this recurs, then one should be considering uh, dialysis or transplant. But uh, yes, so acidosis, metabolic acidosis treated with sodium bicarb. For hypertension, uh, which is primarily due to the fluid overload uh, and as well as uh, congestive cardiac failure and edema, one should try uh, conservative measures, low sodium diet and a fluid restriction to less than one litre a day. ACE inhibitors like remipril and lisinopril, of course, they can uh, precipitate acute kidney injury, but they're renoprotective in chronic kidney disease. Herbisartan and fruzamide, our friend fruzamide. Um, nausea, one can only use you know, on dancitron and metoclopramide. Uh, for pruritus, uh, phosphate binders and antihistamines. Anemia, one can use an erythropoietin stimulating agent um, to treat the normocytic anemia, which is the same kind of anemia one finds with the anemia of chronic disease. The difference being that total iron binding capacity, I think, is reduced in anemia of chronic disease, where it's normal in anemia uh, from chronic kidney disease or the other way around. But anyway, um, if one's on peritoneal dialysis, one can develop peritonitis uh, due to a PJP uh, infection, and so one should use uh, antifungal. Uh, phosphate, hyperphosphatemia, one can use phosphate binding, cevelomere, kinesinical set uh, blocks PTH and makes it more sensitive, um, and diet restriction, obviously. Bleeding diathesis, so when you have platelet uh, dysfunction due to high um, levels of nitrogenous waste. 
what the Americans call azotemia. One can use desmopressin, aka DDAVP, for type O calcemia. One can use calcitriol, which increases gut absorption and bone resorption. And for potassium, uh, low potassium diet and rhizonium. Perhaps you remember at the start I mentioned in terms of uh, past medical history, she'd been on kefepime outpatient for osteomyelitis uh, and uh, left hallux amputation. Um, kefepime for six weeks via a pick line, and this was about week five, I think, uh, when she came back in. She developed encephalopathy on day two, and her urea was within normal limits, uh, less than 35. And then we recognized that the kefepime dose was dosed at a time when her creatinine was at 100, now it was 350, so we ceased it. The principle derived from this uh, episode of caffeine induced encephalopathy is that one must always check all medications. And finally, dialysis. When do we dialyze? When do we stop treating uh, the complications of chronic kidney disease? Well, the problem is we actually will never finish treating them. They will be ongoing. But when do we say, right, this is uh, no longer the case of just uh, patching up the poor patient. We have to actually make a definitive kind of step towards either what they call renal replacement therapy, which is either dialysis, um, hemo or peritoneal, and the various subdivisions therein, or transplant. So we, the mnemonic that we have uh, is have P, which you won't have uh, if you're going towards dialysis. So H, hyperkalemia, and by the way, I should say this is refractory hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia that is not responsive to one's treatment. Uh, acidosis, refractory again, acidosis, uh, refractory volume overload, so non-responsive to fruit to uh, diuretics. Um, elevated urea, uh, which is a problem obviously because with uremia comes pericarditis, pleural effusions and, and irritation of the pleura and, uh, and uh, uremic cephalopathy and pericarditis and encephalopathy. So as I just mentioned, those are the two, uh, the P and the E in P and edema.